Hello, and welcome to Thoughts on Therapy. I'm Brian Stevens, a licensed professional counselor in, Mar in Marietta, Georgia, and the founder of Talk Forward, who's bringing us this podcast today. I've been active in behavioral health for over 25 years, and in that time, I've met all sorts of knowledgeable people. Thoughts on Therapy is the show to bring their knowledge to the general public. Today, I'm interviewing with Michael Barnett, who is a licensed, okay, who is a licensed psychotherapist currently residing in Los Angeles, California, with over 30 years of clinical experience. Michael is an ICEEFT, International Center of Excellence in Emotionally Focused Therapy, certified supervisor and trainer in the Emotionally Focused Therapy for Couples, or EFT, and is the founder and director of the Atlanta Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy in Atlanta, Georgia, where he practiced the majority of his career and he continues to work with clients virtually there. While in Atlanta, Michael is a full partner at Pine River Psychotherapy Associates, a highly respected and visionary private practice in Atlanta since its inception in the 1970s. Michael has ardently worked towards integrating working with addictive disorders through both traditional experiential processes. This humanistic attachment-based work cul culminated in creating an approachable framework for tailoring the emotional focus therapy model to more effectively treat custom couples who present on the addictive continuum. All righty. So okay. I'm excited because to talk to you because I see clients in my private practice who often have a spouse who has some sort of addictive problem. Yes. Um, and the work that I've done uh, with a lot of folks with addictions. And of course, the, you know, the reality is if somebody in a, in, a, in a couple has got an addiction, you know, there's, there's a problem that brings the entire relationship. So 30 mm -hmm. years is a long time. And I, I worked on some of your history. Is there anything about your background I missed that we need to go over? Nothing about my background. It's, okay. I've been in the field a long time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the EFT Center that you founded in Atlanta mm -hmm. um, and that you've been director for. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. So starting in about 2005 or six, <clears throat> I got wind of this model and I had been on an odyssey at that point in time to bring about an experience I started having. And that was when I was successfully completing courses of therapy, mm -hmm. couples therapy, I had noticed that the two people in the relationship came out intrinsically different and kind of grown as a result of the couples therapy. And I wasn't expecting that. I was really well-trained in individual therapy. I was really well-trained in group therapy. My advisor in graduate school, I think in his own kind of rascal-esque way, threw me a couple super reactive couples and I was just flying by the seat of my pants. And it was really engaging because there was a live wire in the room. And I find that in therapy, when there is real reactivity, or if I say it differently, the issue is showing up in real time in the room, we can really get our arms around it and sink our teeth into it and create change much more effectively. Right. So I got, I got really, really interested. And I trained in Imago, and it just kind of wasn't a fit for me. I trained with David Snarsh, who took some issues with Imago in a certain way and made some sense to me. And then I heard and took John Gottman's um, level one training. And he kept right. talking about a woman named Susan Johnson. This is 2002. Never heard of her. He said, this woman is doing phenomenal empirically validated research on process-oriented experiential psychotherapy called Emotionally Focused Therapy for Couples. And I thought, holy cow, I've got to meet this lady. So I finally was able to train with her and I was on fire because it was this integration of systems work, which meant we were looking at the relationship as an entire entity that had a reactive pattern that could inadvertently gain enough momentum to disconnect a couple. Right. It's working experientially in the way I was just talking about, the issue shows up in the room, reaction shows up in the room. And if you know what you're looking at, it's an incredible opportunity for healing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was really powerful is I'd heard of attachment theory and I peripherally knew about it. But when you start getting into the details of how attachment theory is organized, it looks as, at people's behaviors as these very functional strategies to solve for something, solve for feeling left out, solve for feeling alone, solve for feeling unseen, solve for feeling not mattering to a partner. Right. And yet when you just look at the behavior in itself, it's really easy to pathologize it and see it as so negative. But we use that as a way of 
kind of like having a keyhole into people's <coughs> experiences. So I got very interested. I was literally a community of one here in Atlanta, or I, right. say here, I lived in Atlanta for so long and it's very dear to me. Um, but I um, started doing presentations on this and I started showing up in university classrooms and at churches and lunch and learns and Ridgeview Institute, for example, right. I was doing presentations and slowly but surely got trained and brought, started bringing a couple people at the time, there were only two or three certified trainers to Atlanta. And we started ultimately over time doing the certification track training, which was a four day immersion and then five meetings every other month, kind of for a weekend. There was a, a advanced class and advanced training all based on clinical interventions. And slowly but surely, people started taking these trainings. So this year, I just completed my 17th four-day externship. Wow, okay. No, I'm sorry, 15th, but 17th advanced core skills training. And um, five years ago, we uh, started creating a genuine community that was, it's a 501 3C nonprofit organization where people come together and we offer EFT training. We offer additional trainings for EFT therapists. We have kind of a opportunity to socially network and just be together in this really incredible model. So it's taken on a lot of momentum and there are several hundred people who are now part of the Atlanta Center for EFT. Okay, ASAP. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's yeah, really cool. Great. exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, so it already kind of speaks to me a little bit because I'm a big believer in strategies. You know, hmm. Behavior has a uh, outcome in mind and people have behaviors. And, you know, one of the things I've, I've been on supervisees and staff about, um, and sometimes clients themselves, is what well, the behavior, you know, the client, so somebody might say, my well, client's just attention seeking. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should give them some attention then. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they're asking for. I'm in a detox unit and, you know, one of the nurses might say, well, they're med seeking. Yes, yes, they are. They're detoxing from drugs. So they, they know mm -hmm. to take drugs to feel better. So mm -hmm. I, I love that idea of let's look at the let's look at those strategies. Yes. As, exactly. as strategies and not as just pathologies. 100 so, percent Well, let's dig into it then. Let's let's talk <laughs> a little bit about EFT. Um, mm -hmm. what makes it unique? What has you it just obviously has had you lit on fire for decades. Yeah. So yeah. So one thing I'll say about it, and I can say this now in hindsight, having been um, working in the model for quite a long time, it is now very genuinely, um, it is the gold standard for marriage and couples therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no researched theoretical model that comes even close to the uh, outcome results that we get in our research. We have 30 years of empirically validated both outcome research, mm -hmm. and process research. And what's interesting about the process research it is we have researched literally the process model for doing the therapy. What works, what doesn't work? How do you integrate what works? How do you create a comprehensive model of psychotherapy? So what separates EFT out from other models? And there are other models that say we are also attachment-based. But what I have not encountered, and from what I was sharing with you before, I've looked far and hard. I, I have trained with some of the best in the field over long periods of time. It wasn't right. just taking a training. Um, but what separates it out is there is a way of turning the concepts and the conceptualization of attachment theory into very clear systematic interventions. Okay. We, we apply that in vivo. And so why that's important, and given that this talk is really for the public, you don't need research to tell you this, but there's a ton of research that when people go to a marriage or couples therapy and it is skill-based, here are a bunch of skills, here are communication skills, here are problem-solving skills, negotiation skills, what research shows is that for the first few months, it does make a difference. And all therapies, including EFT, look about the same. But when you look at longevity research, what sticks and creates stability and connection over time, the others fall apart. They're essentially Band-Aids. And what EFT believes is if you don't look at the attachment bond, and that means something very specific, if you don't look at what's underneath that and start working on the healing that's underneath that, right. you can put as many strategies on the surface and you've built a house of cards where people essentially relapse and backslide and are right back to square one with their conflict relationship driving the whole show. And it's very painful. It's very painful for couples. It's very painful for therapists to find out I'm not getting traction and I'm not right. people effectively, right? So EFT looks at what's happening in the bond. 
and we watch the way people are interacting. So we almost use the uh, topic as a backdrop. We got in this fight over co-parenting. Not that that's not important, but we will say what happened when you started fighting. And we start to find out people have these very, very predictable interactions and the way a partner might lash out speaks as loudly or even maybe more loudly than the disagreement on how to parent. You just, my partner, my significant other, just completely lashed me down. What does that say about who I am to you? Right. And what does that say about what this relationship is about? And it also begins to open a door, usually to people's histories. I know a thing or two about not feeling very important. And now we can ultimately use the past in a later stage of the therapy as it shows up in the present to do very deep healing of kind of the wounds and pains that people have carried for a lifetime. But we make people's partners the antidote for people's historical wounds. And there is nothing that bonds couples more deeply than de-escalating a conflict pattern and then doing that level of intense work together. Right. But if right. you show yourself warts and all, and insecurities and all, and parts of yourself you don't like, and your partner meets you with love and respect, it's a game changer. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Right. And it's very different than most models. Well, I, I, because what I think you really hit on something there at the end, because I, so, so my, I really come from a, um, a lot of my approaches over the years has gotten a lot more um, kind of interpersonal, transpersonal approach. And I've really come to believe that in the human heart is a yearning. But, well, is a fear that if I was fully known, warts and all, I'm unlovable. 100%. And, and I want more than anything else in the world to be fully known and, and find out that somebody is willing to love and, and accept me. And, I'm, and, and, and simultaneously, I'm not sure I can accept somebody else, warts and all. Yeah. But I'd love to be able to. So I, I, I feel that that's, that that's a, a truism, and I, I see this individually with people not even being willing to love themselves and their warts. How can anybody else love me? That's right. So I, if, I, I can see if a couple is willing to do that, of course they walk out. Changed yeah. <laughs> people. Exactly. With, a, with a different sense of, um, probably a different sense of groundedness, and then other people look at that relationship and go, what? You know what sorcery do they have going on <laughs> that they yeah. can that they yeah. they can manage? Well, let so tell me a little bit more about the attachment. Uh, maybe this the attachment lens with EFT. You called it the gold standard. Yes. And you know I think attachment um, therapy or talking about attachment something people hear a lot, but it's never well d defined for for the average person. Hundred I think that's that's a really important comment right there. Um, because it sounds like a Hallmark card. And what we're really talking about is the vast majority of theories, therapies that create really deep, long-lasting change, more or less will utilize what we call in therapy, a transferential process, right? A person, a client starts to get connected with their therapist and then they start to get activated in the session and the therapist, if can, they can stay clear and objective knows that they are the wiser, stronger other, and their client is projecting some things that actually give them access to the internal landscape where people are wired. And that's really hard to get to, and that can take a long time to get to, especially in individual therapy. So once people are in, they can create immense change. What we pay attention to is something called the people's attachment systems getting activated. And if I pull back the lens and offer a 10,000 foot view, and this is from neuroscientific research. There's something called social baseline theory. And what it basically says is as, as mammals, and especially social mammals, our nervous systems, our central nervous system is an open system. And in the same ways that we require food, water, air, et cetera, for optimal functioning, our brains literally require healthy, loving, consistent, safe social engagement. So the brain, through the process of evolution, expects secure attachment. Now, it's a birthright, but it's not a given. And for most right. of us, it's not a given. And some people come from extraordinary hardship. So all of a sudden, the natural circuitry that is open and available to make our brains, as in our world, as you know, we call com complex. The complexity neurologically 
is something that offers so many different patterns and pathways for uh, our, our neural pathways to function it means we're able to take in more, update information more quickly, stay grounded in the world, live in a more full optimal way. Well, that can get altered when our environments aren't healthy and loving and right. it changes in circuitry. So what is essentially saying is our attachment to and our connection to loving others has everything to do with our hardwiring for not simply survival, but for really thriving in the world. So EFT utilizes that understanding, and it understands that when we are working with significant others, and we never lose sight of that, that a typical moment of hurt is happening at the hands, if you will, of a partner who you have very different needs and expectations and experiences around than anybody in the world. Right. I have a need to feel safe. I have a need to feel loved. I have a need to feel seen. I have a need to matter. And that doesn't play out with, even with some friends, it doesn't play out. There are very few people to get in the inner sanctum. So when we see people get into distress in a session, we know their attachment systems are being activated and we will slow a moment down and we will start to explore what is really happening in this moment and help right. people talk about it in a meaningful way. And there are really two main strategies that are called insecure strategies, which are one involves lashing out and one revol involves shutting down and shutting out. So when we see that happen in session, we get behind it. We say, what just happened here? Help me understand the meaning of that and help people have an interaction that doesn't involve either shutting down or lashing out. Instead, we're helping people get in touch with themselves emotionally, emotionally focused therapy, and lean in and begin to talk to their partner very directly about that awful experience that we see as a key moment that plays itself out over and over and over in the life right. of the relationship. So we start to change the dance. So okay. that's Thanks essentially so. EFT in a, in a nutshell right there. Right. Um, yeah, well, I love it because and uh -huh. I love that with couples therapy, the ability to say right now in the moment, we want to be aware of what's going on. Right. Um, which is, you know, kind of my people are like, well, how do I how do I, you know, not be anxious? Well, to start with, recognize that you're anxious. And then, uh -huh. right. Can you take a minute? Can, can you not let the anxiety be in the driver's seat for five minutes? Put it in the uh -huh. passenger seat and listen to what it wants to tell you. And, yeah. and with couples, it's like, and of course, you talk about the neurobiology. It's like, okay, I'm therapist. I'm here. Let's slow things down. Let's reactivate the cerebral cortex. Let's get back and let's get the frontal cortex operating again. We're not ignoring our limbic system. No, no. It's not, it's not in the driver's seat. Let's see what it's telling us. What are these emotions about right now? That's, that's the key right there. Let's see what it's telling us. So an EFT... We call it bottom-up learning. We do go into the limbic system, but people feel our presence with them while we do it. And right. when they go in, we help them discover what is really happening in there because all your partner sees you do is lash out at them. Then it turns out, well, I lash out because your wall goes a thousand feet high and it's been doing that our whole relationship. I love you. I can't find my way in. I'm alone. I'm starting to feel helpless. So I try to raise the roof to get some kind of attention. But we take people into the limbic the anxiety, and we, right. we, we co-burden that or co-regulate that with them. And when people then feel that, and they're often tears involved, then they turn to the partner and say, there's moments, you only see me angry. I'm missing you. I'm alone. I want to feel closer. I don't know how to get your attention. And it is the emotional expression that's very vulnerable. Again, this is part of attachment processes. When people are open and vulnerable, it has the power, we call it, of organizing social interaction. It pulls people to you. If I start yelling at you, What's it going to do? You're going to fight me or go away, sure. right? But it's the same distress internally that we're helping people in this case get in touch with very directly right. and then share. And the nice thing, you use that word, you're in your anxiety, and they don't have to be in it alone anymore. They right. can now be in it, invite their partner in. And that same moment that would create disconnection, we use to create a moment of connection over and over and over in the therapy. Yeah, I love that. That makes that it makes a whole lot of sense. What one of the one of the one of the weird thing I'm trying you know talk about this with clients who are worried about you know fear of being vulnerable. I said, but the reality is vulnerability, and I, I think you hit on it with our social system. We're wired. We actually most of us perceive vulnerability as strength in other human beings because we'll look at them and say, "Wow, they're comfortable enough to be this vulnerable." And most human beings outside of maybe some sociopaths and, <laughs> you know, kind of raw predators look at vulnerability as an opportunity for connection. 
And, and we can't really have genuine, I, I don't believe you can have genuine connection with another human being without some exchange of that vulnerability. I agree, but you know, it, it's a tall order sometimes too. That I, I, I'm right there with you, Brian. At the same time though, you know, if you peel back the layers of things, that it's just part of the fabric of our even culture, we're, we're a culture built on rugged individualism and mm -hmm. some vulnerabilities look down upon and uh, working with people from other cultures, there are a lot of different rules, often unspoken about vulnerability and emotional vulnerability and emotional expression. So you, what you were saying is so spot on, but I also know we actually, ironically, I guess, run into vulnerability about being vulnerable. And yes. sometimes that can look like pushback or fear or all sorts of things, right? So um, when people are in the stance you were just sharing, which I loved, that we privilege it. And it's really quite, quite a sense of strength, quite frankly, to be able to be vulnerable and still lean in. Not always so easy for everybody. And that can show up in the, the dance of right. couple therapy. So the reason I like doing couples therapy is it shows up in the interaction. And we have a lot of different handholds to be able to get into really meaningful work with people that really creates change much more quickly. I much prefer to work with a couple or a family than I do somebody individually. I've been in plenty of my own individual therapy and you can kind of hide out <laughs> and always get activated, but you put a partner or partners who are in distress in the same room and you see the whole drama, the dance play out. Right. And there are lots of access points to really, really help people. I think much more quickly um, than at least I know how to do individually. So, right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so let's, speaking of, of helping people um, yeah. and getting into things quickly. So, I'm, I'm really fascinated with how you're folding addiction, right, and working in with this model. Um, but before we jump into that for, our, for, our, uh, for the viewers, addiction is one of those words that I think is used a lot, but is poorly defined. Yeah. So uh, I'm a big believer in defining terms. I do it with my clients all the time. Well, tell me exactly what you mean by that. Okay. So how are you defining uh, addiction as we talk about it? So, so to speak about how I do define it, I'd like to also offer a contrast because the most, it seems to me, benign description, if I can pull it from the back of my head about addiction, is some version of people continuing to utilize behaviors or substances in a very compulsive way in spite of the fact that those very behaviors or compulsions continue to net very negative results. Mm. Okay? Okay. And so what I would say is a little bit different and it's really organized around the ideas of attachment theory. Um, we live in a very complicated world and the faster it goes, the more disconnection there is. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of abut disconnection up against all that we've been talking about with regarding attachment, and it doesn't just happen in individual levels, it happens in societal levels. Um, people become somewhat disenfranchised with historical means of being connected, having a sense of belonging, right. part of tradition, part of a community. And often their communities get very fragmented. People start to experience a notion of something that's called dislocation. And I think we can experience this very personally in the sense, again, of not belonging, losing a sense of meaning, losing a sense of purpose, not feeling connected, feeling alone. So if I offer a definition of addiction, I would say that it is kind of a use of a substance or a use of a behavior that actually has a functional part to it. Not that it's healthy to do, but its purpose is to help people feel less pain right. or less alone or less distress or a buffer to anxiety or a way of kind of coping with very complicated internal suffering. And the caveat I would put is when loving, caring others are really not an option to lean into in the way that you and I have just been talking about. Right. So if you think about it that way, it's very non-pathologizing. Um, in trainings I run for therapists, actually, uh, I do this one part of the training where I say, I just want you to shoot from the hip and to keep this anonymous, we do a big word cloud that people can type something in uh, and it shows up on the screen about one word. And I say, what comes up when you say it, when you think addict, you know, and you get stuff like gutter bum or loser or uh, vandal or crook, 
uh, you get all sorts of stuff. And the reason I do that is because you said you hit the nail on the head and you said addiction can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it often means something very pejorative or negative. But if you start looking at it this way, and there was a guy, I, I actually got to do an amazing presentation with a guy named Gabor Mate, who you may have heard of. He's written a lot of books and he's a big voice in the field. But uh, he said, we should uh, not be focusing on addict or addiction. We should be asking a question and as what, where's the pain? Mm -hmm. In other words, you start to understand what it's like to walk a mile in somebody's shoes in their relationships in their lives. And you get a very human story that sometimes, again, when there aren't other others there who you could really reliably lean into, you'll find some way of taking away the pain of that. Right. And Absolutely. That's, that's how I yeah, see it. I, yeah, and I that's that's very much how I see it. I, I I've of course have said to said to supervisees, you know, we talk about addiction and well, maybe they don't quite understand or believe in addiction. I'm like, are you the weight you want to be? Mm. And almost nobody is the weight they want to be. And I'm like, well, why not? Well, because all you got to do is eat, eat less and exercise more. So why aren't you the weight you want to be? Well, it's hard. Well, that's the same circuitry that's, mm -hmm. you know, and we talk, we talk about comfort food. Mm -hmm. I'm eating to change my mood. Um, and and I have, you know, in, in my working with people with addictions, outside a few people that were chemically addicted because of like they went through surgery and they just needed to chemically detox. Yeah. There was always some significant pain, something going on. Um, I, I, I can't stand the way I feel about myself. I've got crippling anxiety. There's something going on with that person that, that drives that that pain. So I agree. I, I like your different way of defining yeah. addiction. I'm, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad. And I, and I, and I, I too kind of come at it from a, um, I, I really kind of a pretty behavioral background is that addiction is a type of behavior. It's a coping mechanism hmm. um, that we use. And you used relapse earlier. Uh, I love you used it about not addiction, but about returning to behavior. Yeah. Once I'm a firm believer that once we develop a coping skill, or strategy or whatever you want to call it. We never let it go. We might not use it, mm -hmm. but it's always in our toolkit. Mm -hmm. And we can get stressed out enough to go get it. Our, our default coping skill is to write, whine and scream and pitch a temper tantrum <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's all we could do. Um, and so I feel like it's always in there. So how, when, so we take this model, take that addiction. How do you, how do you work with addiction in this model with the focus therapy it's a great question so let me think about how to approach that um so i want i want to speak to it again start from a high level and then i'll get to a more detailed level um there are two studies that even though i know this is a, a podcast intended for the lay public Mm -hmm. um, but they're worth knowing about, and they will kind of shed light on the question you're asking me and maybe be helpful to people. Um, one of them was called the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And um, the other is by an organization called the National Epidemiological, they call themselves NISARC, and I don't remember what the acronym stands for. So the first one was very related to addiction in that it was a, uh, it's been a, a replicable, repeatable study that started with 17,000 people for the CDC. And it was really looking at um, a, an obesity treatment program and all the strategies people had learned. And what they started finding is even though people were really, really well taught these strategies and initially were losing weight, outrageous numbers of people out of 17,000 people, it's not a small study, started relapsing. They started, and this was just being uh, viewed from a public health perspective. It wasn't being looked at through a psychological perspective or an addiction perspective. Right. And they were scratching their heads. They couldn't understand why the heck were all these people who did really well in our program all of a sudden relapsing like crazy. And so then they started looking at some of the intakes. And what they started finding is so many people had led really hard lives, and they had things that were categorized as an adverse childhood experience. Uh, physical, emotional, uh, sexual abuse, 
neglect, going through right. a rent, divorce, really terrible things. And they noticed when people had a certain number of them and four is kind of like a hallmark, um, there was a trauma response. And so what they had ineffectively, or that's not the right word, uh, unsuspectingly had done was they took away the thing that people were actually coping with their unresolved trauma pain, which was using food. Right. And so when they did that, everybody relapsed because they did not have anything to self-medicate with. And he said, what we are seeing here is really some form of strategy that has an adaptive function. People are trying to solve a problem and the problem is they're in pain. Right. So that's an important thing to hold because I've really become a very full believer that just under the surface of addiction are people in pain and oftentimes people who have un a lot of unresolved trauma. The NISARC study studied 43,000 people and for public, these numbers, 17,000, 43,000, they're outrageous numbers. Like very few studies get that many anywhere come close to that. I've done a research study. We got like 35 people. So the NISARC study did something unusual and they studied a cross-section of the American public as an addiction study. And usually addiction studies are based on people that have had treatment or out of treatment. So this one wasn't. They did find that a significant number of the people in the study had what would cate categorically be uh, substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. Some people were actually dependent on those scales, significant numbers. And what they found is that 75% of the people out of these 43,000 people actually recovered naturally. Now, for my world, because the people who come see me don't recover naturally, right. I didn't know that information until fairly recently. And so I started thinking if 17, if 75% of people somehow age out or mature out of their addictive process without any formal treatment, who are the 25%? And I believe that they are the people that were kind of showing up in relapse in that ACE study. So I first wanna paint a picture of context. So how EFT would deal with this is when people have been traumatized, there are certain characteristics of trauma that are inherently relational. Oftentimes people have been traumatized by the inner circle. Maybe there was molestation or incident, mm -hmm. awful kind of abuse within a home. The person I'm supposed to trust to have my well-being as a priority is harming me. Right. That's inherently traumatic. There are other kinds of traumas that may not be from the inner circle, but people go through these horrific things. And if there aren't people we can lean into for some form of comfort, care, and connection, which attachment gives us, then we're really in a deep place. So it makes sense people might reach for a drink or a drug or porn or whatever it might be. And so what we do in therapy, um, we have to assess where people are on the addictive continuum. Sometimes people need more treatment than simple, simply couples therapy. Right. But what I believe is that psychotherapy is a piece of the puzzle in treating addiction and treating it well. And I also believe that if we don't heal the underlying trauma, it leaves people who might even be sober at risk for relapse at some point in time. So we have to do a very complex process in the therapy and that is to really help the person who's been using feel safe in the therapy and feel seen in the therapy. And we open the channels for them to be responsive. And this is gonna sound tricky to a lot of people listening to this, but to be responsive to the pain they've caused their partner. Because oftentimes when people are really in the throes of addiction, they don't see that. Right. Or it's so shameful to see that they can't let themselves see that. And it goes on and on. So we will open the channels for that. And when I worked, I worked for eight years in inpatient and uh, partial treatment programs. And back in my day, uh, although people would never say this, but shaming was almost given license as a clinical intervention to break denial. I'm going to make you admit you're an addict. I'm going to make you admit you have a problem. And when people are shamed, there's even more reason to use. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. There's research on that. Right. There's research. So in this case, we help people start to find a way to acknowledge the pain, help their partner feel seen and loved, and at the same time, through that process, feel a sense of efficacy rather than I'm always letting my partner down, and begin then to use the relationship in turn to deal with that pain relationally, interpersonally, in the same way I was sharing a few minutes ago with a partner. So we really heal the deeper parts. Now, concurrently, what I have people go to an individual therapist or group therapy or program, um, other forms of concurrent treatment, sure. Right. We have to help stop the behaviors for people to do the deeper work. And will relapse be part of that process? Sure, it shows up. 
but we want to start looking at the trigger. And there's so many different things people can bring to the relationship. So we like to say, we like to create a substitute replacement of attachment and connection for the addictive process. Right. So yeah. it's, it's so it's, it's, it's listening to you talk about that in my head, what I'm thinking about when I talk to people about substances is I've often talked about the relationship with the substance. Um, and you, you're talking about that's what well, so you, okay, I have an attachment to alcohol or I have a attachment to <laughs> methamphetamine or, mm -hmm. you know, it's, this is my, and, and, and I've had clients really talk about that. This is like my best friend. This is my primary relationship. Mm -hmm. I also hate them. I also, yeah, I also yeah. hate this, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm caught in this, I'm caught in this dance um, with it and I don't have any control over it. Or maybe sometimes people are like, well, I don't know about my drinking. Is my drinking a problem, right? They're just worried about their relationship with their drinking. It's like, okay, well, I'm not gonna call you an addict or not call you an addict. I'll leave that up to you, but let's talk about your feelings with this and what is it that you do that leads you to drink? Right. right. What are the what are the other feelings you coming into that? Right. So no, that's right. And the tricky. I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, but like, it kind of then makes me, you know, kind of think about. We talked about the natural recovery. It's like mm -hmm. just, I've had clients who very much literally will be like, "Yeah, I used to be a problem in college, but you know, I grew out of it, and I'm, you know, and I'm fine now." Um, and it's like, okay, well, and, and then often what happened is there was something they resolved. Well, I can speak in, to that. In that and, time, yeah. And uh, I can speak to it all in, in, in a moment of self-disclosure. Uh, I used pretty intensely through my teens and in college, like pretty intensely. And I had a moment where I decided I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, I started working in, at, in addiction treatment programs. And what the only criteria oftentimes for other counselors there were that they be in recovery. So I would tell them my story and they'd go, holy crap, you did what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, that was my life. And it was, it was nuts. And I'm so glad I'm done. They said, we couldn't have stopped without treatment. So I thought I was the aberration. I thought I was right. the unicorn, like everybody needs treatment. And I got lucky. And uh, it never occurred to me until the last few years, again, because of the world that we inhabit, people don't come to us who are naturally recovering. People come to us because they're stuck and addiction's grabbing them. And so I really, for many years, had this myth that most people really need treatment. And I'm not, uh, when we talk about 20, that 25% of people, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So what I'm trying to say here is, there can be these moments of change where you age out, you say, I need something different in my life. I can no longer live with the value of doing this to myself, yet I want some other things in my life, a relationship. I want to have better values. I want to have a better job. Morally, this isn't working. But there are, there are a lot of people where it's about something else. And that's what I think showed up in the ACE study. Right. And, uh, you know, even though 25% tends to sound like such a small fraction it's an enormous number when you just look at the sheer number of people. So, so many people are suffering in that way, right? And I even think more so uh, currently these days. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. So, how does this speak to, you know, what you would see? I mean, I, before I got into private practice here this, this last year, I was in a couple of substance abuse programs. One was detox, res, had a nice mental health component when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, which I was kind of like everybody's duly diagnosed. But, um, yeah, that's I've, I've, I've often felt, I've always felt that. When I came from the mental health side. I've always felt the SA. It's like there's there's more going on. This is how it's being expressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was at a PHP IOP program. Um, kind of what's your take? Would you say then? You know, you talked about addiction treatment in the past. What do you feel like we are um, in the world today? So, so what I'm, what I'm going to say. Um, I'll just be uh, rank about this. It, it may rub people the wrong way. And I just want to be sensitive to that. So I kind of see addiction as the common cold of the mental health field. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. 
if you start peeling back layers of what's been happening um, political, socially, what I specifically mean by that is the mechanism for more and more modernization has created kind of the displacement I was talking about before. And right. there are predictive models that show fragmentation, dislocation, and drug addiction. You look at the meth addiction, for example, or I mean the meth crisis, that large companies like Monsanto plant themselves somewhere. And all of a sudden people have had generations of let's say farming or cattle raising or whatever, they're out of work. Right. And they have to find a place to go. And their traditions are shattered and their families can be shattered and their community shattered. And what's left, at least in that case, there are all sorts of chemicals they use for farming and agriculture that happen when you put them together, they can make a literally very toxic mix. And the crisis went haywire. You can find examples of that through history. So why I'm saying this is we've been treating addiction for over 100 years. The main models that permeate our culture start with there is a drug. So, so I grew up mainly in the 70s, as my, my formative years, teenage years. I remember the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. I was essentially saying these drugs in and of themselves are so immensely powerful. We have to keep them out of the hands of people, away from people, because people will lose their will, they will lose their capacity, they'll lose all of their strength, and they'll be taken away by these drugs. And some pretty bad things happened as a result. That became unpopular. And the next thing that came up was this notion that addiction was all organized and caused by people really not having moral strength of character. We hear character defects in the program, right? right? Um, and they were saying basically people have an ethical lapse or somehow their character is morally uh, not depraved, but negative. So when people aren't fit to be morally part of society or with themselves, where do they go for treatment? You can answer that question, jail. That hasn't worked out so well. So the next phase, it says there's this thing that is just so by itself empowered is the brain disease model. And this is where things get really controversial because you can look at research and NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has a ton of research. Mm -hmm. And they say, this is a brain disease. You can see the brain on drugs. You can talk about the neural pathways that get hijacked by addiction. And you can also talk about and with great detail the impact on neurotransmitters. So therefore, it must be a disease. Um, I don't believe that. And where this gets kind of very cloudy is it often gets conflated with genetic predisposition. Lots of people are genetically predisposed for addiction. But just because you're predisposed does not mean that's predetermined. Correct. Because behavior is a combination of genetic predisposition and emotional environment. We all know that. So why am I mentioning this? Because it has everything to do with your question. Because those are the things that inform treatment. If that's the problem, how do we treat the problem? We have medicalized that model. We have treatment centers. We have a multi-billion dollar treatment industry that continues to use technologies or models that aren't working. So right now we have at best a 30% efficacy rate. And I know in my practice, if only three out of 10 people are getting better, I'm feeling pretty damn bad. I gotta figure right. something out. But that has not been the case in the addiction treatment field. We continue to use the same things over and over and over again. So do I pretend to have an answer and do I say EFT is an answer? No but it's a piece of the puzzle. So when I think of treatment, I do think that we do need to help people psychotherapeutically. Here's the gift of psychotherapy. We can help people heal from the inside out. As they are healing from the inside out, we can learn a thing or two from history. And there's a great story about um, the drug on, I don't know the drug on war, the war on drugs in Portugal. And they used to kind of do what the United States did, but they took it to a very different level and it was much more intense. And it was driven by this very enthusiastic, emotional saber rattler for war on drugs who happened to be the national chief of police. Mm -hmm. At the time, Portugal had the highest uh, heroin addiction rate per capita of anywhere in the world. And it wasn't working. So to this man's credit, they shifted gears intensely and they started providing group for people. They started providing liaisons back into the community. Mm -hmm. They started providing training, vocational training. Um, they started providing kind of communication training. And they found this liaison where in a very short period of time, they cut it in half. And what I'm, what I'm hearing in that uh, feels very 
connected to a much broader perspective of attachment. How can people have lives that feel purposeful, meaningful, connected, full of tradition, a sense of belonging, and also the capacity to be able to interact in a way where they can be connected? Mm -hmm. So, so the therapy piece, the psychotherapy piece feels we can use EFT or other models, but I of course prefer EFT to help heal the deep pain that people carry that they often self-medicate or self-soothe with right. addiction. But I think we're looking at a more comprehensive picture. We're really trying to uh, heal the problem of addiction in a more humane way, in a very, a very human way. Well, I, I, yeah, I think I agree with a lot of that. I, I do, I did, I think the evidence is clear that some people are predisposed, but the mental health disease people are most predisposed genetically to get is schizophrenia. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, schizophrenia, and that is only if an identical twin has it, you have a fifty percent chance. Wow, wow. And that's so of the gold standard of genetic predispositions. That's wild. So. Everything else is it can run in families, mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, what I've seen, I've seen families where dad was an alcoholic, but daughter has anxiety. Son seems OK. Right. One wonders if dad maybe had anxiety that he treated with alcohol, but daughter's not going to do, you know, so this this kind of how we address our 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 our, our mental pain or the, the emotional pain kind of also, I believe, has different generational okay. um, expressions. Yes, me too. Um, of, what, of what that generation considers okay or, or doesn't consider okay. It's kind of interesting, it's kind of total side note from addiction, schizophrenia. Um, working in community mental health, we work with some pretty refractory or, or difficult to treat people with schizophrenia. Mm. And at the time, Clozaril was this miracle drug. Yeah. even more powerful than some of the other atypical antipsychotics, but it's a dangerous drug because it can cause, well, effectively cause your blood to crystallize. Mm -hmm. And so in order to take it, you had to get blood work every week. This is all Brian hypothesis here. I have no study. No, I love it. I love it. I'm following you. I believe part of the magic was that that client had to come into the clinic and see a nurse who physically touch them and, and what uh, people, a lot of people with schizophrenia do not get touch, do not get human touch at all. I think some of those clients did better on Clozaril because they were getting a weekly caring, mm -hmm. literal hands-on intervention. Mm, that's a powerful now, process. I love that. Now, of course, I was putting a needle in their arm to, to get blood. <laughs> But and then the entire system was set up to you got to get your blood work to get your medicine because if you go off your medicine things will be bad and we got to start over at ground zero because of all these FDA protocols that are in place. So that attachment, I'm some human being is taking care of me is attached to me. And my thought was, well, what we really then ought to be doing with people with schizophrenia is spending a lot more time reaching out to them to attach to them. Yeah, and yeah maybe I we'd get better results so I, I think that that's true a friend of mine i i, I want to get him on does a he work he's a ride-along therapist with the cob path program and they do visits to people who are kind of frequent 911 callers and their program has dropped 911 calls of, the, of their caseloads to almost nothing and the number of arrests stopped you know in many cases and why because they're going out and say hey what's going on i i I've been giving them away. Yeah. blown away by that, and I'm not surprised at the yeah. same time. I love that. No, that makes perfect sense. You know, we've just gotten away from that. And um, I have a, as, as also as a sidebar, um, so being an EFT trainer, it's a kind of a small group. There are only 24 of us or so in the United States, but we have trainers in all so many countries across the world. And I have a friend who lives in Norway, and he and his partner were taking a, uh, it's not like a six week vacation. And I said, God, I'm so envious. You know, you've got your six week vacation. Right. And you know, he said, our country set up differently. He said, you have to work so hard in the United States. He said, our government takes care of health care and college and it has maternity and paternity care. And he went on and on. He said, you have to pay for that. And therefore you have to work a lot. 
And the reason I'm saying this is sometimes we can get so caught in something. Like I, I have really meaningful work. I really love my work. I really value the work and I love being able to help. It's really consuming. And sometimes it can take you away from the simple humanity. That's what you're talking about. Just simple right. touch, a moment of care. And it can get us so far away from the most basic human kinds of things. And I think that's what attachment theory really capitalizes on. So, some of this isn't rocket science, that basic connection and feeling, feeling a sense of safety and that you matter and being seen well and knowing people are going to be there when you need them to lean into. That's a game changer for all of us. Right. Again, it's a birthright and not a given. So as we talk about addiction and it having a functional purpose, it's trying to help people with pain, the challenge of it, of course, is it takes on a life of its own and then it can be very life-threatening. Right, not just for the person right. you, but for their families and their relationships and their, their livelihoods and right. It's, it's, so that's it becomes so it becomes a whole different layer of complexity in terms of what people are going through. Right. Right. Absolutely. Challenge. Yeah. Well, I think I could ask you about two dozen more questions <laughs> around a variety of things, um, but I know you have got a hard stop coming up, and yeah, and we have been at it for a while, so. Um, I'm, this has really been very uh, interesting for me and exciting, and it's nice to hear that the gold standard fits so well with some of my preconceived notions about <laughs> people and um, how, they, how they function. Um, That's been a really lovely conversation. I, I've appreciated your questions. I've appreciated your responses. Um, I've liked the way that we could kind of talk and at the same time share some perspectives and bring something different to the conversation mm -hmm. as well. It's yeah. really nice. It's really so, nice. Well, I um, so your contact information I will put down in the hey. in the uh, area in the comments in YouTube. Um, of course, it, since this is YouTube, I invite our viewers <laughs> to uh, click the like button, click the subscribe button, do your notification bell. Please comment. All those things help the YouTube algorithm. At least that's what all the other YouTubers say. <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with me today. Well, thank you for the invitation. I've really enjoyed talking with you, Brian. And take good care. And I, I'd even invite you to come join us for an EFT externship in Atlanta. I need, yeah, I need to look into doing that, actually. I'm, I'm inspired. It's a wonderful community and uh, it's a wonderful training. And it's, it'd be a nice addition to, sounds like the many tools you already have yes. in your tool belt. It's really wonderful. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.